students, it is week 25 and this is your history video. I am here, as you can probably guess, um, in France. Well, I've come back in time to the time of the French Revolution. I am um, speaking to you as a queen, um, a noble woman, um, knowing that to be a noble woman during this time period is not a very good idea. I would have ended up um, in the guillotine and I would have lost my head. But let's um, take a look at some of the events that led up to this. It wouldn't have mattered how kind a person I was. It wouldn't have mattered how good I was to the people that worked for me. Um, how well I paid um, those who farmed my land. None of that would have mattered. The fact that I had been born into nobility was all that they needed to get rid of me. So what caused this um, anger and resentment? Let's talk, let's uh, read a little bit about that. France was an unhappy country. Louis XIV had spent most of France's money to build his huge palace of Versailles, Versailles and to carry on long wars. Louis XV had lost the Seven Years' War and made France even poorer. Both of these kings had forced the poor people of France to pay more and more taxes, while the rich paid almost nothing. The French thought of themselves as divided into three different parts or estates. Roman Catholic priests were the first estate. They didn't have to pay any taxes because Catholicism was the official religion of France. The noblemen of France were the second estate. Many of them ruled over huge mansions and farms that had belonged in their families for hundreds of years. They spent months at Versailles with the king and served as his generals, ministers, and ambassadors. Most of them paid no taxes or very little. There were about 30,000 people in the second estate, but there were 26 million people in the third estate. All of the merchants, shopkeepers, doctors, farmers, lawyers, judges, wagon drivers, peasants, bakers, tailors, and cobblers of France belonged to the third estate. These working people paid taxes on salt, soap, wine, tobacco, and leather. They paid taxes to the church. They paid rent to the noblemen who owned the land where they worked. They paid fees to grind flour, press grapes, and cross bridges. They were poor and they were hungry. France was suffering from the worst wheat crop in hundreds of years and there was no bread. An Englishman traveling in France was shocked at the hunger of the peasants. They looked, he said, like scarecrows. Meanwhile, the noblemen went on spending millions on parties, clothes, coaches, and gambling. I, I promise I wasn't doing that. Not at all. Never. No parties. Why would I be dressed like this? No, Louis XVI suggested that the second estate tar start to pay taxes, but the noblemen re refused. You see, Louis XVI looked like an absolute monarch, but he had to have the support of the noblemen and the army to carry out his wishes, and Louis had other problems. His young queen, Marie Antoinette, had nothing to do. So she spent her time dancing at balls, buying expensive dresses, and playing cards. She had a whole little village and farm built so that she could pretend to be a dairy maid, carrying a milk pail made of a priceless porcelain. Her brother called her a featherhead. Marie Antoinette was not a cruel woman. She was a good and careful mother to her three children. She was so soft-hearted that she cried when she heard that peasants were starving. But she had no idea how miserable most French peasants were or how they felt when she spent millions of French francs on a party lit entirely by candles or on a simple country dress of priceless fa fabric. Marie Antoinette became more and more unpopular. Uh, the French whispered that she alone had caused France to be poor, even though the country had been in debt long before Marie became queen. When the Declaration, Declaration of Independence was published in America, it was translated into French and published in France as well. Millions of French people read its words about freedom and equality, and then they looked at their own wealthy queen and idle nobleman. Wasn't a shopkeeper or farmer the equal of a lazy aristocrat? While the French grew more interested in the idea of revolution, France's treasury grew emptier. 
Once more, Louis XVI tried to make France's noblemen pay taxes, and once more they refused. They would only pay tax, they announced, if representatives from all three estates met together and decided that new taxes were necessary. Louis agreed. In May of 1789, delegates from all over France came to Versailles to talk about taxes. Some were clergymen, some were noblemen, and some were the merchants, shopkeepers, judges, and lawyers from the Third Estate. And one of these lawyers was named Maximilien de Robespierre. The members of the Third Estate soon were fed up with the meeting. They were told that they could only wear black clothes to show that they were less important than the members of the First and Second Estates. They could only use the side doors of Versailles. When all the representatives went to church for a special mass, there were only reserved seats for the First and Second Estate members, and the Third Estate were expected to find places wherever they could. And then the king decreed that each estate would meet in a separate room and cast one vote about the proposed taxes. The third estate couldn't possibly win a vote against them, even though the third estate represented most of the people in France. Um, because the first and second estates would vote together not to pay taxes. That was the last straw. The third estate renamed the meeting the National Assembly and begged the priests of the first estate to join them. Many priests who had spent years working in poor towns where the people were starving agreed. Even some of the noblemen agreed to join with the Third Estate. They realized that France would never be a healthy country if most of its people were hungry. But the remaining noblemen ran to Louis and begged him to halt the meeting before the National Assembly took over. So Louis locked the Third Estate out of their meeting room so that they couldn't vote. So the new National Assembly met on a tennis court and took an oath called the Tennis Court Oath, swearing to make a new constitution for France. Louis commanded them to go back to their own rooms, but they refused to leave. One of the noblemen repeated, The king has ordered you to go. But the National Assembly shouted back, We are here by the will of the people, and we will not disperse except at the point of bayonets. In Paris, only 12 miles away, word spread of the Third Estate's revolt. The common people of Paris began to arm themselves, ready to support the National Assembly. Louis XVI began to get worried. He was afraid that his French soldiers, who belonged to the Third Estate, wouldn't fire on the rebellious commoners in Paris. So he ordered the Swiss soldiers, who were part of his royal guard, to march to Paris and restore order. The common people of Paris heard that the soldiers were coming. Die rather than submit, they shouted. But to fight up the soldiers, they needed gunpowder, and where would they find some? To the Bastille, someone yelled. <coughs> the Bastille, or the royal prison of Paris, was an old fortress with eight towers and walls 15 feet thick. The mob started to push cannons up and aim them at the walls. The keeper of the prison decided he'd better surrender. Only seven prisoners were inside, but the revolutionaries freed them, took the gunpowder, chopped off the keeper's head, and ran through the streets with it stuck on the edge of a pike. It was July 14th, 1789. The Bastille had fallen, and so had the power of the French king. And the fall of the Bastille is still a holiday in France, just as July 4th is a holiday in the United States. Now the commoners ruled in Paris. Throughout the countryside, peasants revolted, invading the mansions of the rich and murdering the hated noblemen of the second estate. Some noblemen and clergy decided to join the revolt. Others fled the country. Louis XVI and his family were put in a carriage and taken to Paris, where they were kept in the palace of Tuileries and guarded. The National Assembly also went to Paris and took over the government. Now it was time to write a new French constitution. Like England, France would be a country where the king had to follow the laws. And like America, France would be a country where everyone was equal. The Reign of Terror. Not the Tower of Terror. The Reign of Terror. Imprisoned in Tuileries, the royal family waited to find out what would happen to them. Meanwhile, the National Assembly argued about France's new constitution. The clergy and the well-off members of the Third Estate, the doctors, the lawyers, and merchants, wanted to put Louis XVI back on the throne as long as the new constitution gave him no power. But most of the Third Estate, led by Maximilien Robespierre, insisted that France would be better off with no king at all. 
Robespierre made speech after speech, trying to convince the whole assembly to get rid of the king. The assembly couldn't quite decide what to do with Louis XVI, but they were sure that they wanted to get rid of the second estate. So the assembly declared that there would be no more titles in France. No Frenchman could be a duke or a baron. Instead, everyone would be given the title of citizen. And a month later, the assembly announced that priests would have to be elected by voting like politicians. Now the first and second estates had been outlawed, but many in France still secretly hoped that the king would return to the throne and rule in the old way. Some of these royalists plotted with Louis XVI to sneak the royal family out of the palace so that they could flee to the north of France. There the king could gather royalists around him and try to reconquer his country. Louis, Marie, and the children managed to get out of the palace and into a carriage. But as the carriage rattled through a little town called St. Menhold, a man by the side of the road peered in, and he recognized the face of the man in the carriage. It was the same face that was on the money of France. The man leaped onto a horse, galloped ahead to the next town, and warned that the king was on his way. A mob assembled and stopped the coach. Louis and his family were taken back to Paris. They went on waiting and waiting and waiting. Then the commander of the Prussian army sent a message to the National Assembly. Hurt the king or his family, the message warned, and Prussia will invade France and destroy all of Paris. When the people of Paris heard about this threat, they shouted, The king is a traitor! He's been sending messages to our enemies, begging them to invade his own country. The fading hatred for the king was blown into a hot, angry flame. 20,000 men and women stormed the palace of Tuileries, killed the king's Swiss guard, and dragged the royal family to a dark dungeon called the Temple. No one could escape from the Temple. Encouraged by fiery speeches from Robespierre, the National Assembly decided once and for all that France would be a republic. And the Assembly renamed itself the National Convention. Now France would be governed only by the National Convention, which would be elected by the people. Hatred for the king spread to hatred of everyone who had aristocratic blood. French noblemen who had been part of the revolution started to flee from the country. Those in power wanted nothing to do with the king or with nobility. There was only one remaining fate for the king. Like Charles I, he would have to be executed. So on January 21st, 1793, Louis XVI was taken out of his cell. Don't seek revenge for my death, he called to his son as he left. He was marched to the town square at the center of Paris, where the guillotine, a sharp blade that dropped down on the necks of its victims, waited. The executioner cut his hair short so that the blade would slice cleanly. Louis started to make a speech to the mob, but the drummers nearby quickly started to beat their drums so that he could not be heard. He was pushed forward onto the guillotine. The blade fell. A soldier held up, his head, held up his head and shouted, Long live the Republic. People ran forward and soaked up the blood with handkerchiefs and bits of cloth so that they would have souvenirs of this great event. The king was dead, but the French Republic was in trouble. Other European countries watching with horror hoped that this madness would not spread. Soon England, the Netherlands, and Spain declared war on France. And in the west of France, many peasants who were loyal Catholics rose up and rebelled against the National Convention and its treatment of Catholic priests. The National Convention was afraid that the Republic would fall, so it formed a new committee called the Committee of Public Safety and put Maximilien de Robespierre at its head. Robespierre was given the power to arrest anyone suspected of disloyalty to the Republic and put them to death. Robespierre had all the peasants who had rebelled in the west of France arrested and put to death. Then he began to send everyone who might have sympathy for noblemen, clergymen, or kings to the guillotine. The reign of terror had begun. The National Convention passed a new law called the Law of Suspected Persons. Under this law, anyone who was against the revolution or even seemed not too enthusiastic about it could be executed. The first person convicted under this law was Marie Antoinette. On October 16th, nine months after her husband's death, Marie Antoinette was driven to the guillotine in a rough farm cart called the Tumbrel. She wore a white gown. She was only 37, but when the executioner held up her head, everyone could see that her hair had turned pure white. 
Marie Antoinette was not the last of Robespierre's victims. He accused thousands of people of plotting against the Republic. Men, women, peasants, old people, even children. In towns all over France, guillotines fell. Old women would sit beside the guillotines, knitting socks for the soldiers, chatting and laughing at each other, and occasionally cheering as the guillotine fell. If blood sprayed on the knitting, so much the better. The blood would fill the soldiers with revolutionary fire. The guillotine was claiming both the innocent and the guilty alike, wrote Helen Williams, an English citizen in France who was arrested and then released. The gutters seemed to stream with blood. By the time that 16,000 French citizens had been guillotined, the National Convention started to worry about Rose Pierre. He had too much power. He had grown suspicious of everyone, even his own friends. Members began to whisper that it was time to remove this man before he became a dictator even worse than Louis the Sixteenth. Robespierre got wind of the convention's doubts. He stormed before a meeting at the convention, yelling that a plot was being formed against me. I know who is set against me, he shouted. They too will be rooted out and sent to the guillotine. But the National Convention did not like to be threatened. The next day, one member after another stood up and made a public speech condemning Robespierre. Robespierre, unable to believe what he was hearing, sagged into a chair and grabbed his head with both hands. He was arrested and dragged away to the guillotine where so many others had died. Finally, the reign of terror was over. France had no more king, no more Robespierre, and no more leaders. Well, um, we will talk about um, what happens after um, this. It's just interesting, students, to contrast um, um, the American um, Revolution with the French Revolution, the differences and the similarities between both. Um, we were battling against a foreign power who was trying to rule and control us. France was battling with themselves, essentially. Um, we, um, we fought, um, and there was death and killing, but we didn't turn on each other and become spies um, accusing each other of not being um, involved. Um, Benedict Arnold was one example of a spy who was killed for supporting the British and the Loyalists, but um, for the most part, people were allowed to choose to be Loyalists or choose to be Patriots, and there were no consequences. However, in France, as we've seen, there were um, constant beheadings as a result of even a suspicion that you weren't supportive of the revolution. And I can't imagine that at this point, many good people were in support of it. It had gone so terribly wrong. Um, it um, resulted in a constitution of sorts, but we're going to see in France that their constitution could not be sustained and maintained. Um, and that was probably because they didn't have the three branches of government in the beginning that enabled it to survive. They needed a president. They needed a judicial branch. They needed um, the Senate and the Congress um, to help keep those powers in check. Well, um, France, you see, is leaderless at this point. Um, and there was really nothing to do to stop Rhodes Pierre other than just executing him. Of course, in America, we had George Washington, who became our first leader who didn't want the power for himself, um, who was a reluctant first president, in fact, and um, willingly, of course, stepped down when his time was done. So you can see differences and similarities. July 4th, July 14th, um, we celebrate the signing of the Declaration of Independence. In France, they celebrate the storming of a prison and the beheading of a guard. Um, so it's just, it's just fascinating. It makes me grateful for the more peaceful way that America gained its independence and its freedom. Um, how hard for the people to have to fight and give so many lives 
to um, gain their independence in France. Well, students, we'll um, love for you to talk some more about the similarities and differences with your family. Um, you can look up so many interesting um, things about the French Revolution if that interests you. Um, in A Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens, um, he begins by calling this the best of times and the worst of times. We can see why it was the worst. Why do you think it was considered the best? Well, because freedom is a wonderful and worthwhile goal. And for the people to be treated equally and to have food and to have a say, not to be unfairly taxed was a very worthwhile goal. Um, it's just so sad that it took so much blood um, to get there. Um, one of my favorite movies is The Scarlet Pimpernel, as you know. So with your parents' um, approval and permission, that might be a fun one to check out at the library and watch. Um, Percy Blakeney is trying to rescue some very good nobles from the guillotine in France. And in fact, even tried to rescue Louis XVI's son, the Dauphin, the heir to the French throne, who was just a little boy at the time. So those are some of the exciting events that occur in that um, movie that I think you would enjoy. And we'll catch you next in Wednesday's video. I'm grateful I still have my head. Um, and um, I hope you keep your head as well as you work on your action items and other um, studies this week. See you later.